Well, I'm here at Glenifer Community Church where we're about to start worship shortly, but I thought given that it's Animal Sunday this week, I'd go and say hello to some of the people that are waiting outside already. The cows way down in the background there are a symbol of the fact that animals for many Christians have been in the background of our ethical consciousness. When we've thought about what it means to be disciples, we haven't often thought about our relationship with the earth and with other creatures in those terms. We've tended to do a really good job of thinking about other humans and advocating for the poor and for justice for people, for humans around the world. As you'll see in the worship today though, there's always been a Christian tradition which has held the importance and the value of animals and our relationship with them. Many years ago, when I was a student just starting out in theological college, one of the senior students preached a sermon in which he said that you can't be a Christian unless you're a vegetarian. I was telling him about that a couple of years ago and he didn't remember it, and at the time he was only being semi-serious. But as I listened to him, I knew that if I really thought hard about what he was saying and about the biblical references that he was quoting, then I'd probably end up with agreeing with him. Given that I didn't actually want to stop eating meat, I decided not to think about what he was saying. But then some years later, I found myself in my final year, this time up on the tablelands in Queensland on a retreat, looking at some cows and realizing that God was saying to me that part of my Christian discipleship for the future was going to be not eating them, that it would change my relationship with them in a way that was necessary and positive for my faith. And so I became a strict vegetarian for about eight years. Then my wife and I had a child. We fed him meat because I wasn't going to go to all the trouble of having a vegetarian kid. And of course I ate his scraps. He got a bit bigger, the scraps got bigger, until 10 years later, I was just eating whatever meat crossed my plate. And that's continued basically until I started preparing for this Animal Sunday in the season of creation. I looked again at the liturgy, at the confession that I prepared, which you might use as well, and it challenged me again to rethink my relationship with other creatures on the planet, about doing for them as I would have them do for me if the tables were reversed. Now, on this planet things eat things and there's nothing wrong with that, but the way that we treat animals before we take them off to be slaughtered and in the process of slaughtering them does say something about who we are as human beings and who we are as Christian disciples. So I've become convinced that it's time to get back on the bandwagon, either of being vegetarian or of eating meat that's been ethically killed. Fortunately, my wife has been coming to the same conclusions through a different channel over the last couple of weeks, and so that's something we're going to take on as a family. Now I must admit I don't remember anything specifically from that sermon 20 years ago, but now that I'm back in my study I thought I'd look up a couple of Christian websites and recheck some scriptural references and share that with you in the couple of minutes that we have left. The initial thrust of the idea behind Christian vegetarianism, and Jewish for that matter, comes out of the Genesis story, where humans are given all the green plants to eat, as are all the animals. The initial diet of humans in the Edenic garden is meant to be vegetarian. Although it's true that in the story after the flood, Noah is also given the animals to eat as well. What's pointed out though is that the great prophetic hope, especially expressed in Isaiah, is that one day we will return to that state of the Garden of Eden, where the lion is able to lie down with the calf and the wolf is able to lie down with the lamb and none will hurt or harm on all of God's holy mountain. The prophetic hope, the prophetic ideal, is a return not only to vegetarianism, but to a lack of killing whatsoever. Vegetarianism, in other words, is seen as an ideal, the way things could be and would be if all people were full of the knowledge of God. Jesus says nothing about vegetarianism, and it's recorded that he ate fish, but he does say a lot about the poor and caring for the hungry, and vegetarians point out that eating a diet high in meat uses a lot more resources, so there's less food around to feed human beings. Cows consume a whole lot of grain that could be fed directly to the poor instead. Paul's only interest in meat is arguments about whether or not we should be eating meat that's been sacrificed to idols. It seems clear that he's not assuming that a vegetarian diet is a good one. He does, in fact, call people that eat only vegetables weak in their faith, 
But again, that's because they're not eating meat, specifically because it's meat that's been offered to idols. He's not really entering into the debate at all. What he does have, though, is this vision of the groaning of creation which is waiting for liberation. This creation, he says, has been subject to futility, but it's subject to futility in hope that one day it will find freedom. It will be set free from bondage to decay and instead will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Other creatures then for Paul have been waiting with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God, which for most Christians is presumed to mean us. The appearance of the followers of Jesus, the children of God, is meant to herald freedom and liberation for all creation. Paul ultimately seems to be thinking of the afterlife, but it's clear in the rest of his writings that our adoption as the children of God, the spirit within us, is meant to mean real difference here in the world around us. For Paul and for Jesus and all the Bible writers, we are meant to be trying to live the way God intended, even if we realise that it's a struggle and that we will never be completely free of sin at the moment. But we are meant to strive for that ideal, that desire God had in the beginning of creation. We're meant to love God. We're meant to love our neighbour as we love ourselves. We're meant to live out our chief purpose, to glorify God and enjoy God forever. So if we accept that we're meant to strive to do all of these things, even if we'll never do it perfectly, why don't we also accept that we could strive to live the way God intended in terms of our relationship with other animals, with the other creatures that God created to be our companions and not our food? And if you're not totally convinced, then why not just try it out? We know from the scriptures and our own experience that trying to live with our neighbours in the way that God intended is essential in our attempts to live with God the way God intended. So perhaps the same is true in the way we live with God's creatures. If you intend to keep eating meat, as I do, then there are some questions we can ask ourselves about our discipleship. What kind of meat will allow us to still consider ourselves to be the servants and protectors of God's garden? What kind of meat can we eat and still consider ourselves to be good neighbours to the rest of creation? What kind of meat would be an appropriate sign of the fact that the coming of the children of God is a sign of liberation from bondage for the rest of creation and other creatures? What kind of meat eating is a sign that creation is being set free and obtaining the freedom of the glory of the children of God. What kind of difference should Christians be making so that it really would be true and obvious that other creatures have been waiting with eager longing for our arrival here on earth? So the invitation is to experiment. Try being vegetarian for a while, or maybe even vegan. Or make a commitment that the only meat you eat will come from animals that have led a good life, that have been looked after responsibly and slaughtered humanely, and see whether this different relationship to the other creatures on the planet has any effect on your relationship with the God who created them all. We're going to be trying with it again as a family, and if I'm here next year for the season of creation, I'll let you know how we went. If you're watching this on YouTube, or after church want to log on there, you might want to put your comments under the video and let us know what you've discovered about your relationship with God through changing your relationship with God's creatures. And if you're already a vegetarian or an ethical eater, let us know if that's had any effect on your faith. If you're producing meat in a way that reflects Christian responsibility for the rest of creation, then let us know how that's been for you as well. Have you seen it as being a part of your faith and your responsibility and discipleship? What has it meant for your relationship with the animals that you're responsible for? And what has that relationship meant for your relationship with God? Well, if you're watching this as part of Project Reconnect, there'll be some questions for you on the screen to discuss amongst yourselves in a minute. And I look forward to hearing back from you about what you come up with.